Welcome to The Property Bible. This show was created for current property owners, people looking to purchase property, and for professionals in the industry. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back to The Property Bible. My name is Kim Ackerman. I am a buyer's agent at Trelease Associates here in Sydney. Welcome back to uh, after a, what a huge break has been for the Property Bible. We've had lockdowns, we've had coronavirus and, and all the rest of things. So we're back in studio now and we've got some big topics coming up. But today is one of the biggest. I've been waiting months and months and months for this to happen. We're going to be talking about the fundamentals and the misconceptions of capital gains tax. Today I have Ridwan Hanan joining us. Hi Kim, how are you? Welcome, I'm very well. You are one of the, the founders of Hanan Accounting and Taxation Services. Have I got that name That's right? correct. That, yes. That's correct. You're making it sound more exciting than <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's very exciting. You're also my accountant. Yeah, I am. Um, and I, I feel like I should have you on a retainer with the amount of times I call you um, every month to ask you random questions about things that I want to know about. But this is probably one of the biggest things. The capital Yeah, we have spoken tax. about this quite at length. We have. And I always like to know, you know, with the different scenarios, how it would work in this scenario and that scenario. So today we're going to really break it down in, in, in more layman's terms for people because, look, a lot of people or buyers that I speak to, you know, they have this mis- misconception that if they own a property and they sell it, that they have to pay the government 50% of their, their gains. Yeah, it's a big um, feared area when it, selling a property. Massive feared area. And, you know, you've got 12 plus years in this space, you know, exactly what you're talking about. So I really want to drill into those huge misconceptions and how people can can sort of govern themselves around Absolutely, this space. and give it a good go. Give it a good go, exactly. So I guess to kick that off, what is CGT or, or capital gains tax? So capital gains tax, um, other than being quite in a misconstrued way, yes, is the basically the gain that you make on a property or an asset, I should say, mm-hmm. uh, between what you purchase it for and what your ultimate selling price is. Okay, there's a bit of nuance in between. Yes, buying costs, selling costs, they all get taken out and put in. Yeah, um, but generally it's the tax you pay on that uplift of the asset mm-hmm. at the time of disposal. Okay, so we're talking about the money that people have made on an asset. In this case, we're talking very much about property Correct. type of assets. Um, now. Not all properties incur a capital gains tax when you go to sell them. Absolutely. So the most common one is people's homes. So where you live and where you've raised your family for a number of years, if you to sell that, at current legislation, the government does not take any tax out for any uplift that you've had. Yes. Given with our crazy markets at the moment, you see a lot of upsizing, you see Mm -hmm. a lot of downsizing because people are taking advantage of the fact that you don't pay any tax on on your property when you sell, so where you live specifically. Again, like a lot of things in tax, there's a lot of nuance in that. Yes. Sometimes you will, can be partial, and I think we'll get to that. Yeah, we will. Um, But at the same time, there are other types of properties that you can purchase within structures, et cetera, which allow you to have exemptions to capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. So um, it is quite complex um, and it is something that you should do and should do. It's something that you should get advice on. Yes. If and when that that time comes and have a chat to your accountant. So... Generally speaking, for an owner occupied for your home, generally speaking, again, you're not necessarily going to pay capital gains tax when you sell it. But again, with, you know, there are specific situations where you will, but we're talking mostly about investment type properties sure. and, and other types of, of property classes or assets when, you, when you're going through this process as well. Yeah. So generally on your investment properties, you'll be paying capital gains tax. Yeah. Assuming you've made money, you'll pay mm-hmm. capital gains tax. So yep. it is something important to factor in when, uh, when considering disposal. And if we're to talk about some of the misconceptions associated with, with CGT or, or capital gains tax, um, I know we've had conversations around the partially rented yes. property. So you mentioned granny flats yes. before. If I have my home, but I've got a granny flat out the back that I've got a tenant in at the time, would something like that be subject to capital gains tax upon selling? 
Yeah. So again, a little bit of nuance. So yes. if it's an ordinary tenant, if it's me or you living in the back, mm-hmm. then you probably will pay capital gains tax on a portion basis. Yeah. If there's a specific type of tenant, which is the government wants to encourage home ownership or housing or social housing or housing for aged, for example, mm-hmm. you may be exempt. So okay. then it becomes down to tenant selection. So you yeah. might be strategic enough to say, okay, well, I'm going to produce income, mm. but to a specific type of tenant such yeah. that I don't pay capital gains tax on the way out. That That's is, important. That is important. And, yeah. it, and it's about having someone like yourself behind whoever's buying the property, you know, just because you're not buying an investment property, it doesn't mean you can't put strategies in place yeah. for future plans to potentially sell depending on on how you're leasing or not leasing out that property. It's good to just know, like that's really good information. Yeah, look, often the, the, what we see anyway in property, given the fact that we do a lot of property advice, is, is yeah. that because people kind of know and feel and love and read and Australians are obsessed with property, yes. to some extent everyone has too much information. And so that too much information translates to potentially bad decision making. Yes. So it's always good to get, you know, professionals like yourself, your accountant, lawyers, anyone you want in place to be able to give you that advice mm. such that you kind of go into that process with two eyes open. Yes. And as you know, with property, sometimes you have to have one eye closed to power through what would be a cycle or any other sort of uplift on that property. Yeah. And, and there's going to be like swords no matter where you go you know like there's double-edged swords everywhere yeah. whether you're you're renting or you're owning or you're you're renting out part of your property that you own that there's always going to be some sort of tax to pay yeah. along the way yeah that's fair to say and i think that's really good to be aware of yeah. right because a lot of people get to the end at the finish line they go yeah what is yeah. it tax to pay yeah right and it becomes a problem because not only as advisors we have to you know potentially part with that bad news but you as an investor, you as an actual taxpayer, you as someone who's going to do it again, yeah. you've got to sort of think a couple of times before you're going to do it. But as we know, is that if you know what you're doing going into that process, mm-hmm. you'll have a good exit. Yeah. So um, a big question I'm going to throw at you because this is probably, and this is a misconception that I had for many years before I got into property as well. Almost everyone I speak to say, okay, I'm going to buy that property, but you know, me and my husband were going to live in it for the first 12 months because then we won't pay any capital gains tax. Yeah. There's no actual blanket rule that says if that you have to live in your property for the first exact 12 months mm. and then you don't have to pay capital gains tax if you sell six years following that. Is yeah. there? Yeah. There's, not, there's no such thing. It's very construed the way that people live. It is. So yeah. I think to unpack it a little bit, yeah. there's no given time set to adopt a property yes. as your principal place of residence, which okay. I think is probably the, the language that most people get confused about. Yes. 12 months is kind of the logical step to say, well, I wouldn't live in a property until, you know, I wouldn't move out of it if it was 12 months or less. So yes. to some extent there is an intention base there. Yeah. But similarly speaking, there's no specific rule which says six, nine, eight, 12 months. Yeah. It's really about what you've formed, what you've done. Your intentions. Your intentions. Are you living there? Are your kids there? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's one thing that you need to cross. Now, the temporary absence rule, the six-year rule that you're referring to, is if you temporarily leave that property for whatever reason, work, travel, whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. the tax office gives you an exemption to say, well, effectively speaking, this is your principal place of residence. Under normal conditions, if you were to sell it, there's no tax. So we give you what's called a grace period of six years. You can only ever have one principal place of residence at a time. You need to carefully understand Mm -hmm. your ins and outs of your property movements. but. Strictly speaking, you need to make sure that you satisfy all the conditions Mm -hmm. of your temporary absence so that way you actually get to sell on that tax-free or the tax-exempted base. Because it's very fluid. Yeah, it is. Something that I've learned over the years. Like it's actually annoyingly fluid (laughs) because (laughs) there's no necessarily very strict rules or regulations that outline, yes, you do pay, no, you don't pay. It's really up to the interpretation of the ATO to an extent. Yeah. It's, it's what is, um, you know, logical or, or what makes sense yeah. and, and your intentions and showing them that your intentions were to live in it, for example, Correct. and yeah. and those sorts of things. Um, so, I mean, I know I spoke to you about a situation a little while ago where I, I had some clients and we were purchasing a home yep. for them at the time in Sydney's inner west. Now, the, t- the, the vendors that we were buying off, the sellers, they sort of said, yep, but part of our conditions are we want to lease back or rent back the property that you're buying off us for the first two months. Yes. And my client's alarm bells went off because they had these misconceptions in mind that, 
Oh, no, no, because then we won't get exempt of capital gains tax if we decide to sell it in the first six years. And I came to you, if you remember, and asked you this specific question, but that's not necessarily the case. No. Because they don't move straight away. Correct. So where it's a condition of that sale, that purchase, it's part of that. It's a contractual condition. Exactly right. So it's kind of part of the deal. So from an intention point of view, if – on the dot, two months and one day, they were to jump in and move into it as a principal yeah. as a residence. Yeah. It's a very short bridge to cross with the ATO to say, yes. well, hey, hang on, that was actually part of the deal. Yeah. Right? So, however, if that became 12 months because mm-hmm. they're getting, you know, fantastic rent, yeah. then you need to consider what your options are with regard to that. Yeah. So, and, and showing something like that, that, for example, um, clearly they're not moving in to their new home because that was one of the conditions of the sale yeah. Yeah. is very easy to do. And and it's about having that conversation with the ATO or yeah. with your accountant to to relay that information. Document it. Document everything it. Everything you need to do. In my opinion, the ATO is pretty good in the sense that if you have those conversations, get rulings, whatever they might be, you'll be in a position where you get you know a reasonable outcome. Yeah. Um, it's where people try and quote unquote, go behind or yeah. do something which out with, with with less information they should and just try to push through, yeah. that's when you get negative outcomes, right? Yeah. So speak to your accountant, speak to your buyer's agent, speak to whoever you might need to to make sure that you've got that best advice yeah. but also come down to logic and common sense, right? Yeah, because yeah. every situation is different. Like I can't, it is. I can't um, say that strong enough. Like yeah. please don't take anything from – this episode and adopt it to your situation very much. Talk to your accountant. Yeah. Talk to an accountant that can be creative with your strategy um, and and look at your intentions for what they really are um, and see how you can get around paying those taxes if it's a possibility and if it's something that you have the right to do during that time. But we always use strategic accounting, not creative. Strategic. <laughs> strategic slash creative, I like to say. But um, another situation that I was talking to you about, and I like to use these examples just to let people know that there are um, the, the – fluidity or the liquidity of, of how this all kind of works. But um, a, a friend of mine, him and his girlfriend are going through the process of renovating a property and they're currently renting elsewhere, yes. but they're renovating that home and, and the intent is to, you know, move in. But they sort of thought to themselves, well, the market's gone up in the last few months, like crazy money. Maybe we sell this mm. and we make our money on it. We never fully officially move in. Yeah. And, um, you know, we move on to something else and, and so on and so forth. Now, a situation like that, which we talked about, um, can go either way in some cases. It's a tricky one. It's a yeah. second curly one. So there is a situation where the ATO might say, hang on, you never lived in it. Yeah. Actually, this is not your principal place of residence. You're renting, you're profiteering, yeah. you've got to pay the tax, yeah. right? Had they lived in it or were they to live in it, move out for a period because they're doing the messy bits, bathrooms and all mm, that type of mm. stuff, you got a better leg to stand on. Yeah. However, you do need to be considerate of the fact of what they're doing. Yeah. If they're doing this on repeat, the ATO might say, well, hang on, this is a profit-seeking yeah. exercise, right? Yeah. Now they're well if within it's a their, one-off. It's a one-off. Or no, they're well within their rights if they move into it, Yeah. you know, do the works, live there for a bit, sell it, totally fine. Yeah. But you have to at least put all the steps in place to make mm-hmm. sure that you've occupied it, you live there, mm-hmm. gas, utilities, all those different things which are important yeah. uh, to substantiate that they're, they're in existence, right? Yeah. Otherwise what you'll find is that the ATO will take a particular view yeah. and it's very hard to shift them from that view. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean, if that was to be a one-off, which it, you know, it, it might be, but if they do decide to do that again down the track, it's just a matter of setting it up so it's more um, like a business type set up because you've kind of created it to make profit like a flip kind of situation you can flip your own home yeah you you read in the papers and domain all the time a couple makes one hundred twenty-seven thousand in you know two months if they're doing all the bits and pieces right to live in it yeah and they're going through that reasonable period period, okay they're in it but if you're renting buying a property selling it continue to never actually move in yeah then you have to judge your own intention yeah this is actually not me living in it yeah this is actually a business so the ATL will take a very similar view have you ever been in a situation this is not something we discussed we're going to talk about but have you ever been in a situation where um somebody um did that as a one-off um you know with their partner or, or by themselves or what what have you and then decided 
I want to do this again and again and again and again. But each time they were, you know, living in the residence for at least 12 months or so, would that still be considered a money-making? No, if they were, if they were living in it, it's fine. Then it would be fine. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Absolutely. it's just about stretching it out depending on their intentions and whether yeah. they do want to keep them as homes and maybe the long-term goal is to make money through renovations. Absolutely. And, and yeah. I think the ATO is okay with that. Yeah. Um, why you'd want to do that and live through the dust, I have no idea. But I know some people that love it. I personally <laughs> love it and I think it's great. But, yeah, it is it is hardcore oh, yeah, it's full on. living through that all yeah. the time yeah, as an sure. ongoing thing. Absolutely. But so yeah. in answer to your question, yeah, you could get through okay. that, have a, a tax-exempt yeah. residency you're disposing every single time. Yeah. Um, however, our, my experience tells me is that people end up going, okay, well, it's easier not to live in this yeah, and then just do it as part of, you know, a, a structured business. portfolio. Yeah. That's going to look like a business. But yeah. again, not advice. No. Um, you know, it's go, just weighing up those things. Exactly right. You know, just make sure that you're getting the right advice. Yep. So you don't have a problem later down the track. That's and that's it. typically a problem with investors. Mm. No one stops you selling. No one stops you buying. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you need to keep all that record keeping for X amount of period. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if there is a change in the way that which the ATO view a particular transaction, you need to be able to substantiate that. Okay. All right. Um, I want to, I just could talk about this all day. I really, we got to get into some tips (laughs) for people. So, um, one big tip I wanted to touch on was the fact that firstly, get your accountant involved when it comes to buying and selling property and your strategy going forward. A lot of people don't realize, especially when it comes to capital gains tax, that sometimes you have to sell or buy in a particular order. Yeah, Would you say that's absolutely. fair? So, um, even with clients I've had, they've disposed of properties which are gains in prior financial years mm. and then sold properties which are losses, losses in subsequent financial years and mm. they can't do anything. Mm. Now, if it's intra year, we yeah. can have some flex over that. Yeah. But it's always good to order your sales. Very okay. common in, in stocks and everything like that mm. is to order your sales. So the loss is before, the gain is after yeah. that. So that way you can minimize your overall capital gains tax. Yeah. So very important. And to, I guess, to un- unpack what you just mentioned, um, there are situations where you will sell a property and you may be at a loss or you'll sell a property and you may have that gain there. And if that gain is going to incur capital gains tax, if you sell that property that you're going to lose on first, you can actually offset that gain. Correct. But if you were to sell the gain one first before the losing one, you can't necessarily offset it depending on how far apart they are. Whereas the loss continues on. Indefinitely. Indefinitely. Yeah. Like Easy, no know brainer. that. Like, I don't know how to, how clear to explain it. Like, know that that is a thing. Yeah. And so when it comes time to sell, like I sold two properties recently um, and I specifically and through your advice sold the loss one literally like a month or two before the gains and I got to offset those gains and, and sold tens. Of, I made like – Tens of thousands I saved just from ordering those sales in a certain way. And I think another point on that is understand that when you're buying different properties, and this comes back to the strategy planning side of things, buying in, say, a personal name versus buying the property in a company name or a trust, that's going to affect the outcome of the capital gains as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like a a huge misconception of capital gains is, is that a company is better. Yeah. Or buying in a trust is better. I get so many clients that says, hey, I've got to manage the tax. I've got to buy in a company or a yeah. trust. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes it can be mm. and you can manage and you can do certain things in particular ways. Yeah. But for a lot of bread and butter property purchases, mm. it's not the case, right? Yeah. So, you know, in my firm we have a thing, don't overstructure for the sake of it, right? Mm-hmm. People love complication mm-hmm. in property purchasing but the rest of the lives are designed to be uncomplicated. So yeah. it's a the true adage that comes through as well mm. there. And it depends on, you know, what you already have versus what you're planning on doing. Yeah, absolutely. Versus um, who you're planning on doing it with Correct. and when you're planning on selling and buying and all these sorts of stuff. So that's why every bit of advice, um, especially with financial advice, um, need not be general advice. It has to be very specific to Correct. your yeah situation so that you can get proper advice and have the best outcome possible. Yeah, absolutely. So Mm -hmm. every good plan has an exit strategy and every good plan has an entry strategy. So if you take that advice, speak to Kim, speak to anyone around you, it is important to ensure that you've got that. Not to be, you know, perfection paralysis mode, Yeah. but 
to take an educated, you know, that's it. Push at something because things change, right? Of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, my plans, uh, my investment plans have changed so much since I started, and yeah, absolutely. It's just about pivoting and, and having the right information. I'm someone who I want to be everything. I want to be an accountant, <laughs> and but you just can't be, yeah. and that's why people hire accountants, brokers, and, and so on and so forth to know all of that spectrum and know all the information around that side of things. Look, it's really it's even tough for us because yeah. tax law from budget to budget changes. Yeah. You know, it, it just it works in you know really really you know sophisticated manners, right? Yeah. So. Knowing everything is one aspect. Yes. Being able to implement everything yes. is very difficult, yeah. right? So all of us know how to eat healthy, yeah. right? But who everyone, you know, struggles a little bit with it. Yes. So those are the things that you need to be in a position to understand that property is exactly the same, right? Mm. Get the best advice as you get, that you can and try and make sure that those that advice is conflict-free, yes. as we've discussed many, many times. Yeah. And then you'll get a good outcome on things like capital gains tax, yeah. right? You don't want somebody who's advising you to hold on to a property just because you're not going to pay tax or you are going to pay tax mm. or it means that they're going to lose a commission, anything like that, right? No. So just be very specific in, in the way that you ask for that advice yeah. and whom you're getting it from. Um, one thing which we just flew over, which I really wanted to to include in our tips here is um, something that you actually taught me last year and that is about the valuation side yeah. of the property. Correct. So this is a bit um, complicated to unpack, but basically if you are keeping accurate records of a property when you've lived in it, when you haven't lived in it, when you've rented it out and so on and so forth, if you get valuations done at those checkpoints of moving out and moving back in again, it's actually going to really, really benefit you when it comes time to sell the property. Yeah. So could you just explain that like a little bit further for people? Absolutely. So how that works is if you, for example, have rented a property yep. prior to moving into it, yep. you need a checkpoint yep. on how much that property was worth mm -hmm. at a particular point. Yeah. Now, typically speaking, it works best if you've lived in a property first mm -hmm. and then you've rented it out so yep. you can change your cost base, right? Yeah. So what capital gains is paid on how much the property has gone up. Yeah, or the, the percentage of time that you've lived in it versus not living in it, right? Correct. So the quick way is to say that if you've turned a property that you lived in mm -hmm. into an investment property mm -hmm. prior to actually renting it out, you should take a valuation. Yes. Because the, the value shift from when you lived in it to when it's rented out, yeah. theoretically that should be tax-free. Yeah. So you need to know what that new date is. So yeah. to your point, record keeping, having a chat with your accountant, getting valuations from a registered valuer yeah. who knows the area, who knows what potential um, renovations you've done to it. Yeah. That can give you a more accurate valuation in the event that in 10 years after you've moved out of it yep. and you want to sell it, what that new cost base could be. So yeah. um, a lot of people get that post fact. And as we know, yeah. the market changes a lot, right? It and does. so it's really hard to go to a value and say, hey, what was it worth back then? Because they're looking at today's problems and it's really tough. Yeah. So have that chat, go get a valuation and mm -hmm. make sure that you set yourself up for the sort of a the best possible way you can minimise your tax, mm. right? Um, and with more information, it's better for you. And um, tell me if I'm explaining this incorrectly, but it's kind of like being able to take out pieces of the puzzle and lessening your capital gains tax yeah, when you're getting extent. those checkpoints. Yep. If you got a valuation, and for those watching the YouTube videos, for you, if you got a valuation here and here, you can pull out that point if you were living yeah. during that time um, and not pay yep. capital gains tax on that growth period yeah, of exactly ownership, right. yeah. if that it's, makes sense. It's, it is that. Yeah. It needs a little bit of nuance, yes. but absolutely. So those, those parts where, help, yeah, really. exactly right. The parts where you're living in it, yeah. you should be able to take out and you can reset those cost bases. You can enter yeah. back into a property and reset those cost bases. So yeah. it is important that you, you strategically look at how you're going to try and minimize your capital gains. And the clients I've yeah. seen who, who plan that actually do it quite well. Mm. And, um, you know, we could branch off into so many subtopics on, on capital gains tax, but on top of keeping accurate records, also keep records of things like renovations, big renovations, because those are considered 
um, capital improvements, they're called. Exactly right. Not for like a, a repairing of the oven if your tenant no. lives in there, but some big stuff. You get a new kitchen put in, floorboards, bathrooms. bathroom, these big, these big things. Even if you hire a buyer's agent through the buying process and that is an investment property, that's classed as a capital Works. cost yeah, exactly and right. capital works for big renos. So you can grab that buyer's agent fee. You can grab those capital costs for renos. You can grab that time that you were living in it as a home and whack it on the end of the period when you're going to be get like, you're going to be charged for capital gains tax. Yeah. And then that squishes it down more and more and more and more. Exactly right. So, so. you can effectively claim some of those, depending on how long it was yours yep. versus how it was rented out. Yeah. And you can reduce the effect of the capital gains tax. Yeah. But it, yeah. it's about keeping accurate records so that uh, someone like an accountant can come in and go, oh, that's going to help us minimize Correct. CGT. That will too, that will too, that will too. And those will be the buyer's agent's cost, your your capital works cost for renos, um, the time that you lived in it, and, and a bunch of other things. Um, I was going to say There was something one else. more that we wanted to go through. <laughs> there is a yes. big misconception that if you were to buy a property and sell into another property, yeah. you can potentially roll over that capital gains. That's a lie. It. That, it's partially a lie. <laughs> okay, right? it's partially a so lie. So you can certainly do that in a specific type of asset, specific circumstance, depending on what the actual underlying asset is, yeah. if it's an active asset, quote unquote. Yeah. But for the ev- everyday person, just a resi property into another resi property, yeah. you can't do it. Can't. Right? So we get a lot of calls about it because a lot of people spruik it. And you got a call from me last week about <laughs> it as well. So it's one of those things where it can apply, yeah. but it's very common for it not to apply yeah. in an individual's name. And to be honest with you, I've had clients who have come to me yeah. years later and sold the property and said, well, I don't have capital gains tax to pay because I, I bought that property. Mm. I go, well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you do. Yeah. And so, again, that advice that you get up front is critical. It's the advice. Yeah. It's it's the right advice. Yeah. Um, I think that the 12-month mark might be confusing people because if you do have a property that you own in your personal name and you hold on to it for more than 12 months, from what I understand, your capital gains tax gets cut in half. Yeah, exactly. So any investment property that you've had, yep. you've held more than 12 months, yep. it applies to all assets, including property, mm. you get a 50% reduction on the yeah. accessible capital gains so tax. There's another thing. It's huge. But, and there, I'm sure there are so many other ways um, that you as an accountant know that you can minimise capital gains tax and that the average person just couldn't know not being in this space full time and not being a professional in this space. So Yeah, and even things like timing. Right. Yeah. If you sell, if you were to sell on twenty seventh June yeah. versus seventh of July, yeah, it's a huge timing difference in when you have to pay the tax. So if, yeah. you, if you're going to reinvest it or you need that cash, that's a good one. There's a huge, there's a whole amount of things that you can just plan, and you can get a lot more um, talk out of those those actions that you make. And then those fees can be rolled over to the next tax return rather than yeah. this tax return just by timing it right. But oh my god, I love this. I love the shit red one. I could talk to you all day about this. Um, I've been waiting to do this topic with you for months. We have. We've had a little bit of COVID activity yes, in between. Yes, we have. Um, lots of other things going on in the side. But thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been yeah. wonderful and yeah. um, great audience and uh, yeah. great stuff so far. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll have many more topics to talk about. But thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, hopefully that all made sense and sheds a little bit more light around the capital gains tax misconceptions and everything in between but um this is our first episode back after a big break and um we hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time